I'm Randy Rohde, and I'm fascinated with entrepreneurs and small business owners. Plus, I love baseball. Every show, I sit down with a small business owner, and we discuss their running the bases of entrepreneurship. We throw the ball around on strategy, management, execution, and innovation. Plus, a little fun baseball talk. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Settle in, grab your Cracker Jacks, and you know what they say. Play ball! And it's a great day for a ball game. And, well, actually, it's kind of snowy here today in the Cleveland area, which is fine. But we'll, we're still looking forward to baseball. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Randy Rohde, and you've got Running the Bases with Small Businesses. And our guest today really is quite fascinating. It's going to be probably in the running for having one of the biggest career pivots that we've ever had on running the bases. And we've had quite a few pivots, but let's get into this. Our guest was born and raised in Cleveland, attended John Carroll University, received a bachelor's in science and business and administration. 2001, he founded the Falls Advisory Group, where for the past 20 years, he's very successfully helped families with their life insurance and financial planning needs. He serves on several local boards, volunteering his time and business knowledge. And then in 2014, a photography interest took him on a life-changing trip to Africa, He came home, founded another company, Peter's Safaris, as well as the Satao Wildlife Foundation. He now can be found traveling the world, educating on wildlife conservation, raising funds and awareness to help both the wildlife and indigenous people of Africa. So welcome today. We've got entrepreneur, business owner, certified financial planner, safari tour leader, wildlife ambassador. The list goes on and on and on. Plus, I will say husband and father. Just get out that out there. Local right here in the uh, Sugar and Falls area, Peter Balanek. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you, Randy. Thank you for having me. You've got quite a uh, whole line of hats that you wear. <laughs> I haven't really had anyone uh, listed the way that you have. And And yes, I'm wondering, who is this person? Yeah, and I didn't even list them all, actually. Conservationist, photographer, philanthropist, documentary film producer as well. We're dabbling in lots of different things. Good Lord. All right, so there's so much stuff. I literally have nine pages of notes to, to roll with you. This could be a record show. But let's get into this thing real quick. So you do wildlife safaris. Can you give us, and you may even want to give a distinction about your safaris particularly, but can you share like one of the incredible animal encounters that you've had on your safaris? Well, we had an interesting one just actually this past summer. My daughter was with me. She was spending um, a several weeks in Kenya riding horses with uh, one of the camps that I work with. And we were out on safari and we had come across a, an older bull elephant. This will be an old male, 30, 40 years old. They're solitary. And uh, he was in musk, meaning he's looking for love. He's agitated and he's running around and they're unpredictable at this point. And we had noticed this, the ear flapping, the head turning, and things like that. But we had to go down this one path, and there were some other vehicles there, and we noticed that he was agitated, went into the bush. We knew that he was in the bush, and so we slowly approached him. And as we're getting closer and closer, my guy looks at him and says, there he is. He's looking at us. And sure enough, a couple seconds later, he comes bursting out of the bushes, charging our vehicle. (laughs) Slammed it in reverse, went forwards, backwards, and of course, I'm still snapping photographs because thinking this is a, a great scene. And it was exciting. It was thrilling. People talk about, well, is it dangerous? And in this particular situation, we were aware and we expected this behavior. I mean, that would really catch you off guard if you right. hadn't done that. And you really do need to know what you're doing around these animals and watching the behavior and monitoring it. So it, it was sort of a planned surprise, if you will, thinking that he might do this. And so we were prepared for that excitement. But it, it was a lot of fun. And oh, um, it, is, it is thrilling. And you also learn over the years that many of these animals, they'll, they'll give you a little bit of a break. 
they'll charge you first one or two are a mock charge. The third one is for real. Mm. So this was just the first one. But he did come 30, 40 yards towards us at full speed. And these, uh, so an elephant in my mind, I have have a very limited experience with elephants, you know, circus kind of things, but they're big, they're huge. You're talking about a five or six ton elephant that's as tall as our Land Cruiser, um, yeah. weighs more than the Land Cruiser. I can't imagine something like that uh, just charging at you w- with uh, whatever kind of intent, but there's so many things I could ask you about just that experience alone, but we're going to get into the whole safari thing and, 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 as as we get in uh, deeper into the show here, but wow, well, that's good. And you were just snapping away. You probably got some great chats. We've got a couple of them, yes. Yeah, nice. <laughs> all Are they on your website already or... They're all there. Many of them are still on the hard drive. You okay. know, we're working right. on trying to put more of those types of things on the website. All right. Well, I will tell folks some just incredible photography images over on petersafaris.com. Get to the website, check out the Facebook page as well. Just some really marvelous photographic experiences, adventures, really some nice stuff. So, but you're a local guy. Harry, and you started kind of in your entrepreneurial journey as a a financial planner. Before I get into, were you always an entrepreneur? Would you classify yourself? Let me state it that way. As an entrepreneur from the start, do you come from an entrepreneur family background? Yeah, I I think it's to some respect, yes. I started a lawn care business when I was 16. I started going up and down our streets looking for customers and then expanding out of the area, literally taking the lawnmower and throwing it in the trunk of my car, didn't have a trailer. Doing that in college, I always had two or three businesses. I was the uh, business manager of the school newspaper. and There was always some type of entrepreneurial bent. My father had a business in Cleveland. He had a couple of businesses that he was working with. But in many respects, didn't always think that I would be that entrepreneur. I thought I would go to college and had the expectations of getting married and going on and getting a degree and getting that corporate job and living that corporate lifestyle. And that never happened. Mm. So it was always in some type of sales development role. So yes, there probably is some type of entrepreneurial bent. But you know, when you're going through it, you don't think of yourself as that. Right. It's just in you know what you do. Same thing with volunteering and starting the businesses here or helping the Chagrin Chamber. I don't look at it as anything out of the ordinary. I just look at it as a skill set where I can make a difference. And that's how many of these ventures have started. Yeah, well, well, that's a great approach. In 2001, you founded Falls Advisory Group. Is that still, are you still operating there? What's the status of that? That one still operates, but okay. you know, now it's, it's for people that know that I do insurance. In other words, I don't prospect for the life and disability insurance anymore, but I do get calls and I do have a reputation in the community and we'll get a call from an advisor that says, can you help my client? They're looking for X, Y, Z. But the reality is, Somehow, some way, the the topic of the safaris come up. And once you start talking to someone about that, the life insurance goes out the window. The conversation (laughs) ends and they want to know about the safari piece. Uh, But it's also been a good group because I do have a nice network of people in Cleveland. All of my safari guests have some type of connection to me. They all come through personal referral, a friend of mine or a friend of a friend. So being able to go back into that community of advisors who do have clients, who do have the means to travel, who do enjoy this type of lifestyle, has been a really good referral source for me. Yeah, no kidding. So did you, with the path of Falls Advisory, did that happen as as soon as you graduated from John Carroll, or was there a gap? Was it an easy transition to form your own company? This is 20 years ago, so... Well, it, I didn't, as I said, I was looking for that corporate job, and it didn't exist. I came out got into a sales role into the financial services industry with mortgages and just got stuck in sales all of the time. Mm. And so the the whole idea of the corporate world went bye-bye. So there were some previous lives prior to Falls Advisory Group. And we won't go into the whole story about how I got into the insurance business, but ultimately it was a good fit. It's something that I understand. I'm good at it. Managing money and projects and things come second nature to me. So it was a good fit. I was good at I am good at the insurance component, but it's not where the passion lies. Right, right. Oh, I can, I can tell exactly. Was it successful right away? I know we, I've talked with so many small business owners. What are, are not only on the show, our clients, people in the community, and everybody always has 
great stories in talking about how they've started their business, the struggles they had early on. Some folks, you know, just right out the gate, boom, and incredibly successful. How was your experience with Falls Advisory? Well, anything in the insurance world is, is slow to, to take off. You're, you're talking about building a business where no one's giving you anything for it. You have to go out and find food every single day and find that new client. So it took on um, you know, a life of its own at the same time. We had a couple of daughters that were young. So part of my role was Mr. Mom. I had an office in Chagrin Falls. The school bus would drop them off at my office at three o'clock. So consequently, my day sort of ended at three (laughs) o'clock. I had, you know, you come into my office and there were playground sets and other things. And the kids would occupy themselves until five or 5.30 when I was ready to go home. And we lived in the village so we could walk to the office, walk home. So family was an important part of that whole process. So I would say that Falls Advisory mirrored and was very closely intertwined to being Mr. Mom at the same time. So <laughs> <laughs> That's a great experience. Have you always enjoyed photography or was that something that came a little bit later in life or when did that begin it's, to blossom? It started in high school. So I was on the yearbook team and newspaper and took photographs for that. I used my dad's camera, enjoyed it. We I did a lot of traveling while I was in college. I did a study abroad over in the UK and then did some traveling on my own while I was over there and had that opportunity, did the photography, same thing in college. And then actually it took a long break for several years until the kids came around. And at that point we were making the transition from film to digital. Wasn't sure if digital was gonna stick around. So well what you're used to touching photographs. That's right, how I grew right. up. You go to you go to the grocery store and right. or the old Kodak stations that they used to have and you wait for the film to get processed. And now you have these images on the back of the camera just like we do on the phone, but no one prints them anymore. And so I had a mental break between, well, we were supposed to touch photographs. So I didn't really buy into the whole digital scene. But as we started having children, then started documenting more things and then it progressed from there. Just in thinking about from an industry standpoint, I'm sure there's several others you could probably come like, oh, this is really has changed. But photography, though, and an image industry, we'll say, that has transitioned so incredibly incredibly I mean, every aspect of it so i remember going taking pictures and you never really knew whether you had a good picture or not now if we did i i didn't self develop so you know i would take them to the kodak booth that was in a parking lot somewhere right. like like in a cvs parking lot or whatever it was or taking them to the grocery store i think they developed they sent them out somewhere and then you never really knew until you picked them up like three four five days later and then you're looking through the packet oh and they're like well that was a bad shot right. <laughs> or that was kind of good but it was all very physical and that was your experience and then digital And now we've got these incredible cameras right in our back pocket constantly with us. And you're always, I mean, my daughter, that's all she did. And her friends, they'll go on a walking trip down to the village and they'll spend half hour just shooting pictures of themselves. I mean, it's amazing. They come back with 200 images and and you're you're thinking of the film days. Well, how many roles would that be and what would it cost? And as I look back in my life and my children have documented their lives mm-hmm. much far, much more than I ever did. Yeah. I mean, imagine if we had these in college, oh, yeah. probably wouldn't oh, be thank, good. Thank <laughs> goodness. There was no history of that, <laughs> yes. but everything yeah. gets documented today. And I yeah. forget the number it's, it's in the billions, two to sure. 4 billion photos taken every day worldwide. Yeah. And, and they're all just getting stored. But many of them, the criticism coming from my perspective on photography, so many of them just stay digital and they, they don't look at them. They don't print them. Right. And so we put together photo books for our guests because so many people come back from this trip and they're flipping through their phone. Like, what did right, you see? Right. And they, oh, that was a bad one. You don't want to do this. So when we come back, I ask my guests for all their photos. I put together a physical photo book for nice. them so yeah. they can flip through and and enjoy their experience because these are meant to be printed. And right. whether it's a picture of an elephant charging or you and your best friend or your spouse on safari, that's what you want to see. So in 2014, you've got quite a life at this point of uh, photography experience behind you. You decide to take a safari trip 
to photograph wildlife, big cats, which ends up really kind of changing your life, that experience. Before we kind of dive into that, had you always wanted to go on a safari? Were you always interested in animals and, and that aspect? I mean, it's one thing thinking, hey, I like photography. And then it's like, I want to go on a safari and shoot wildlife animals. So <laughs> no, I, I've always loved animals. We grew up having a bunch of pets around the house, hanging out with animals. I enjoyed going to the zoo, whether it's even to going to a farm and watching the, the cows. So I, there was always a love of wildlife and a love of animals. And the photography was just progressing to a point where in 2014, I was, you talk to your friends who are fellow photographers and we say, oh, well, we're pretty good. We can do this. We can work on that. And I said, as a friend of mine, I said, we really need to get some outside experience if we want to do this. We need to talk to other people who are doing this at a higher level so that we can learn. Because I'm always looking to hang around people that are smarter, prettier, richer, better than me so that I can learn and inspire and grow. And I said, that's what we needed to do. And there was a trip planned to Colorado or actually to Moab, Utah. And mm -hmm. I started looking at the logistics and I said, we should do this trip. But adding it all up, it was the fly to Denver to rent a car. Right, Hotels right. were $300. Things are coming along. And then on Facebook, I'm following a, an African wildlife photographer. And lo and behold, something comes up that says, hey, there's a last minute cancellation. And the cost was reasonable. And yes, the safari has always been on our mind. We use travel as a way to educate our children. They've been fortunate to see lots of different great places in this world. But every time I researched such a safari, I started looking down and going, Africa is made up of 53 countries. Mm. There's more than a dozen to see great wildlife. So you start doing the research. You go, well, we should go to South Africa. No, we should do Tanzania, Botswana. Well, should I do a private safari? Should I do a group, small group? family safari. And what happens is you just get overwhelmed with all the different choices. And the typical safari was more than our average vacation that we have been doing. So you felt like, hey, this is a really big deal. So for 15 years, I would say I've researched it off and on, but was always afraid to pull the trigger because I didn't know how to do it. And so here, this came, this opportunity came along. It was priced right. But the caveat was there's only one space available. So I do remember telling our oldest daughter at the time, literally four days before I was leaving, because we knew she'd be disappointed, and she was in tears that she wasn't going and the mm. family wasn't going, and everyone was upset with me that I get to go on this African safari without them, where all our other trips have been with the family. Um, so that's, that's what began and how it turned into taking this first trip. And I thought, well, okay, well, this looked good. I liked the photographer. I liked his work. He was using the same camera equipment as me. I thought, well, this will be fun. It'll be a good test trip. Is the memory of that first safari trip that you took then, is that still, oftentimes that first kind of experience is always the most meaningful, but is it still like you think back on, I don't know how many trips you've taken thus far, but is that still one of the highlights, I guess? It is in terms of the diversity and the wildlife and just the overall experience. I tell people so many times, my words and my photographs don't do Africa justice. You'll hear this as a common thread of people. If you know anyone who's gone to Africa, they'll tell you that it's a life-changing experience. And it's such a cliche to say that, and you feel weird telling people that, um, but you just have to experience it. There's no other way to describe an African safari. We just came back with a group for a two-week trip. We got back last Sunday. And to describe to them, I mean, some of the comments they said to me was, Peter, you, you did not oversell this experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, they're just blown away. There's, there's no other way to describe the feeling of going there. So, yes, the first one is always special. You'll always remember that one. Right, right. That first trip as well really had a profound impact on your life. I, I, I guess maybe I'm not even sure how to begin to ask the question around that, but maybe I'll just turn it to you and I'll like explain why, what kind of led up to the decisions that you've made uh, and what you do today. Well, I didn't know it at the time. So you described this. I was just there to learn about photography and right. photograph great animals. And you get over there and you and you look at the person who's organizing this, and there's part of you that says, wow, man, this guy has the greatest job in the world. And that's the first day you arrive, and you're going, boy, I can't believe this guy gets to do this for a living. <laughs> but as time goes on, by Thursday, you realize that it's a job. This guy really has work. He's responsible for you. He's responsible for putting everything together. 
and that Keep glory you out of harm's way. Yeah, and you look at it and you go, okay, well maybe maybe his job isn't all glamorous. And so my only thought on that process at that point was, yeah, I don't want to be a safari tour leader. I want to mm-hmm. come back on this guy's trip. I'll hire him as a private guy to take my family around. But my priority was to go back home and sell more life insurance. I was motivated to do more business development and be able to have my family to bring this experience here. I had no thought of getting into this business, thinking that it's a career transition right, or anything right. like that. And so this, I'm returning, this would be the beginning of April in 2014. And for the next couple of weeks, I'm planning on how can I ramp up my business so that I can share all these experiences with, with people, with my family. But lo and behold, the end of May, I'm flipping through some news feeds and I learn about this great elephant named Satao. And Satao is a big, giant tusker elephant. And a tusker elephant is defined as one whose tusks nearly scrape the ground, each one in excess of 100 pounds. I didn't meet this elephant. He was in Kenya, in a different part of Kenya. I didn't get to photograph him. I had no connection whatsoever to him. But I learned that... that This elephant was born the same year as me, so for nearly 50 years, it's roaming the continent of Africa in Kenya, and during this time, it's fought off lion and leopard attacks, it's lived through floods and droughts and conflicts with humans, but on May 30th of that year, he couldn't dodge a poison dart and he was murdered for his ivory. Mm. And so I just remember seeing this decomposed picture of him from the air and looking at this body and getting choked up. And in fact, I shared this photograph with the group two weeks ago, and I found myself getting emotional again looking at this photograph. And that's been eight years now, seven or eight years. And so looking at this, I'm driving along, mowing the grass, and you're thinking about different things, and this image pops into my head again, and then I get emotional, and I think about this. I'm like, why do I care so much about this elephant? But true to the form that you said before, I, I tend to shoot first and then engage and think and plan afterwards. And I decided that I wanted to make a difference in the lives of wildlife. I wanted to find a way to share what's happening over there, the plight of these animals with people over here. So for us, Africa is a world away. And so I did a little bit of research and I knew that we could raise some money and you might be send me 50 or $500 and we'd send it off to save the elephants. We'd all go on with our lives, but I wanted a more lasting impact. And what my researcher showed is that the best thing I can do is to get people over there Mm. in a small way to become a wildlife ambassador, to be ambassadors for these animals. I don't know who you are or who your friends are or what impact you may or may not have, but I know that if I don't try, I know what the result will be. And that's always been my attitude in in, in a lot of different things. I know that if I do nothing, what the result's going to be. If I try to do something, I don't know what the results are. And that's part of the fun about doing this. So I decided that, well, I'll duplicate the trip that I was on. It was well organized. I had a great time. And so why don't I try to do that? And I'll take six people at a time. And I don't expect people to come back and start a safari business or a charity or anything like that. But you just, I I believe in the power of networking and that everybody knows somebody. And you don't know what you don't know. So I came back and... Again, there was no business plan. This was designed as an avocation. I wasn't ready to jump off and ditch the insurance world. I mean, that was something that I knew. There was some type of comfort to that. This is totally new. So I sent out an email to every single person in my list, five or 600 people, and said, I have a new avocation. I'm not leaving the insurance world, but I had this great experience, and this is what I want to do. And I put together two trips in 2015. And if you'd like to join me, I'd like to take you there. And lo and behold, people responded. Not the people that I expected. Right. The people that I had. I don't know. I don't know what I expected. I had no expectation. There was no business plan. There was no website. This was just shooting from the hip. See what I can do and see what sticks and throw it up against the wall. And like many of the entrepreneurs you've probably interviewed over the years, it just takes on a life of its own and it starts moving and moving. And one day you look back and you're like, wow, it's been seven years. Right. Yeah. That. So that is incredible. And I. I love, I guess, your approach to it. So obviously now it's a business for you and you do, but you really have, and I think you've articulated it very well, this meaningful uh, purpose behind what you are doing. And, And as I think you stated, to really make others ambassadors of wildlife preservation, conservation. And so it, it really, I, 
it, it really amazes me. I guess I'm, I'm just like, wow, so impressed, I, I think, by what it is that you do now and the step that you've taken because it wasn't, I'm sure, the year before you went on the safari in 2014, you weren't thinking, I really want to be a tour guide somewhere and do something. <laughs> right. It, and we've built it into something that's unique and that's special. You asked before, I've always yeah. wanted to go on safari. Yes. But it is intimidating. It can be overwhelming for most people sure. to try to put together. If I'm, if I'm this type A organized person, it took me 15 years. And what I found in the end, I end up attracting people who my clientele are people who have always wanted to do it, but didn't know how to do it or they were afraid. And so the one, th I'm not looking for you to change the world with the wildlife. What I'm promising you is an experience of a lifetime. And using my knowledge and my experience, I've narrowed down the continent of Africa down to the ideal trip mm. for you based on what it is that you want to see and what you want to do. So first and foremost, I'm, I'm, I organize these trips. Mm -hmm. and But it's when we're on the safari and I introduce you to my friends over there, my people in the community, the people who are working with these wildlife and animal, it's just an education process. I'm just there to expose you to see what comes of that. And like I said, there's no expectations. You're not right. expected to come back and change the world or do other things, but I'm there to educate you and expose you to something that's certainly not what you're used to. Yeah, a totally yeah. different experience, which is why the other thing too, I'm surprised at the number of repeat clients that I get. Well, again, coming from the insurance world, that's not typical. You've got to really push people. And oftentimes I felt like I cared more about their insurance needs and their family than they did sometimes. <laughs> and that's not the case in this, this portion over here. I, I'm so impressed though. And I love Earlier, you stated that you used travel to help educate your children, which I love that approach. We try to do some of that as well. But that same concept, that theme, you really try to incorporate as well with your guests on your tours. Then you use this travel to help educate them about this larger, more profound kind of meaning of you need to understand life here in Africa and in these countries, what the environment is for these animals and what potentially you might be able to do or at least be aware of and help in the conservation of this environment. Well, that's why we yeah. I've branded these as socially conscious luxury safaris. Right. The socially conscious portion means that I'm going to – just exactly what you said. You need to understand how these animals live in this world. For us as Westerners, we would want to walk over there and go, look, these are majestic animals. They're, they're, the, they're the icons of Africa. You need to protect them. Stop killing these animals for bushmeat or for poaching. And we just want to snap our fingers and make it, make it happen. But what you find is that when you go over there, they're having the same pressure that we're feeling over here. You look at the deer in your yard. There's more and more deer in your yard because a development went up next to you that wiped out their habitat. So mm -hmm. we're trying to live with the deer. And what do we do? We, we cull them, we cuddle them, we feed them, we do a variety of different things. And it's no different when you go over to Africa. The only difference is you're looking at people that, from our perspective, have so little but what you find out is that they are very happy and satisfied, many of them, and they don't have that desire to chase the latest iPhone and things, issues that we right. have over here. So those are some things that when you meet the local people, you learn about this. But you also see there are no fences to the park. So literally there's an elephant walking through the backyard of someone's village. And it wants to get to that food and it wants to damage it. So when the elephant comes in and wipes out an entire year's supply of that family for their food, we look at it and go, what's the big deal? But you have to put yourself in their shoes and going, they have nothing to eat for the entire year. Their right. reaction is right. to go kill that elephant. So my point in, in educating people is that these people need to benefit from wildlife. They need to be able to be a recipient of all of us coming over there. And so when if people want to go, you, you can go to Africa and stay at these magnificent lodges and fly from lodge to lodge and in and out of the international airport and never see a local person. That to me is, is a wasted trip. You need to go out and you need to drive between these places. You need to see how people live. You need to see what their struggles are so that you can fully understand and appreciate how do we preserve these animals and allow them to live with 
as we continue to encroach on their areas. We put up fences. They have to go through fences. 100 years ago, 120 years ago, you had 22 million elephants on the continent of Africa. Now you have 600,000. Where are they going to go? We've, we've, we've made the area so small. Same thing with lions and the leopards and all the other cats. They need to roam. They need to move. And we see it in a small way here with you know coyotes walking through right, the neighborhoods. Right. Well, it, it, the reaction is, well, get them out of here. Well, they were here first. Right. So a lot of what I'm trying to do is just educate so you understand a little bit more about the plight of the animals, of the people, and is there a way to balance. The future is figuring out how we can live with them. Right, right. Balance. Life yeah. is about balance. So in 2014, you kind of sent out your uh, email, and I'm sure that probably elicited quite a few different responses, some in positive, right? With like, oh, this is great, Peter. I'd be very interested. Others like, what in the world? <laughs> what the heck? Have you lost your mind? <laughs> right? I'm sure you got some of that. Um, and then you planned trips in, for 2015. How did you even know? I, I guess maybe walk me through how you, in the very first kind of trip or that 2015, are there regulations? Do you need it to get certified? Are there licenses that you needed to acquire connections? It's not you're sitting here in, in Northeast Ohio. How do you know who to call and connect with <laughs> there in Africa? Well, that's been a, been a common question. Even the guests today are asking, you know, how did you put all these things together? How do you pull it all together? And I just described to people, it's simple networking that you would do over here, except I'm doing it in a faraway land. Yeah, but, but today you can do that trip much easier. 2015 when well, you like were I, there once. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I, I duplicated the trip that I was on with okay. the help of the other organizers and the owner of the camp. So it, 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 it was, I don't want to say it was dummy proof, but I mean, it was already established. Okay. Uh, I'm going to put you on this particular trip and this is what we're going to do. But my way of growing this business and, and marketing and meeting these people is that first trip, I had two guests that went with me. And so that was a one-week trip. Well, then I would stay on for another week, and I would travel on my own and meet other people. So every time I would take a trip, there's always another one to two weeks of extension of me investing my time and my money on the ground meeting different people. And so the Trips continue to evolve as I continue to evolve and learn more about East Africa, going to Uganda for gorillas, Tanzania for the, the migration or the crater and seeing going down to South Africa and exploring Namibia and other places. Right. Once, you, once I can get on the continent, I have an excuse to be over there. Right. And that's sort of where we, how we kind of pivoted to the Satao Wildlife Foundation. We, were, we had done some fundraising for an organization and I had packaged all of these electronic equipment that she needed here in the U.S. And I started looking in the shipping charges, and it was going to be eight or nine hundred dollars on DHL. And who knew if it ever would get to the ultimate in destination? Right. So I went to my wife and I said, "Well, you realize I can fly for a thousand dollars, and I can deliver it in person." And that turned into what she calls a boondoggle trip, but right. in my world, an exploratory <laughs> trip where it was it was a reason to go again, go back to Kenya. Right. I've got to deliver this. I, this is what I have to do, and I'm going to spend the money anyway. And right. there goes that finance mind and me going, yeah, well, absolutely. look, I mean, I can get some more value out of this. I'm already paying for the trip just in the shipping. And once you're there, these are ancillary costs. And so that's how the business has grown. That's yeah. how I created all of these relationships over there. It's just investing a lot of time. So yes, I've gone on multiple trips, but then I ended up staying beyond that. And that's how you grow the world. Just out of curiosity, how many trips have you taken since that original 2014? I think since then I've been on safari about 60 or 65 weeks. Wow. So I don't know how many yeah. trips, because for this year I've spent, I've done four trips to Kenya and I spent a total of 16 weeks this year during, okay. during COVID. Okay. Some are six weeks day, some are two weeks. So it you know, just depends. Got it. Got it. All right. So now you've become this incredible veteran of safari. And so not being on ever been on a safari, I'm just trying to imagine this a little bit. 
But does every, a little bit different, uh, I'm sure you're not doing just the same kind of cookie cutter. Now, here's just what I'm thinking, because you're working with a small group, could be my family. Hey, we're going over. I'm guessing that you're probably asking us some questions, kind of qualifying what kinds of things are you interested in? What's your physical? Can you do long hikes? Stuff like that. So I'm assuming every trip is a little bit different. Is that right? Am I correct? These, okay. the, these, these are all custom <laughs> to your family and to your group. Okay. That's what I was thinking. But can you maybe just uh, uh, the best that you can lay out kind of a typical trip and you, you know, we're going to fly and say it's a, I don't know, a 10 day trip. I don't know if you just do 10 days or if they're one week or two weeks, but what would a typical trip be? We're going to like, all right, here we go. We're going off to leaving Cleveland airport and let's go. 20, 30 years ago, the average length of a safari was 21 days. It was a big production. It was a long way to go. As people got busier, more access to travel, they can go over there, but the trip started getting shorter. And then they've gone down to the averages of probably around 14 days today. And many people want to do it in a week. They've got a week off. They're trying to fit, fit it into their schedule. They really want to do one of these experiences. So you can fit it into as, as little as 10 days. But in that 10-day trip, you've got, a, you've got a couple of days of flying, a couple of days of acclimation when we get over there. I, in this particular case, if we're going to Kenya, for example, we're always going to do two days in, in Nairobi, in, in the, the capital city. And that's there just to acclimate you to the time change, but also to account for delays, flight delays, or if you lose your bags. That's happened to a lot of people, including myself, a couple of times. And Trust me, once you leave the big city and you fly out into the bush, the prospect of getting your bags gets lower and lower. And so now you're looking at, you're getting on the third or fourth day of safari. At that point, you've, you've cut into your thing. And if you also happen to miss a day because your flight is delayed, you really don't want to miss any part of the experience. So we do spend a couple of days doing some tourist activities and visiting the Elephant Orphanage and feeding giraffes in Nairobi. And then we move on to many of the other great parks that are available, and there's a whole host of them. But if you're coming there for a, uh, a short visit, then we want to visit the popular ones, the Maasai Mara, where you have the opportunity to see all of the big cats, all of the predators, and the big five out, the big Africa's big five. Mm. But then if you have more time, then we're going to explore other parts of the country because each park is unique. Each park has different things to offer. If you're, for example, wanting to really see rhinos, you definitely need to see a rhino on this trip. Well, you could possibly see that in the Maasai Mara or some other places, but it's going to be difficult to find, and you may go home without seeing that. But there are rhino sanctuaries and other places where you will get your fill of rhinos. Or on this last trip, it was part of it was all about the elephants and seeing baby elephants and orphan elephants. So we went into Amboseli and the Savo ecosystem where Satao was, where you can still see herds of 100 elephants all together. So while you'll see elephants in the Maasai Mara or some places in Tanzania, you won't see a group of 100 of them, but you can go to a place to see that. So yes, it's all depending on, I'll give you some ideas on what you, some people have an idea on what they want to see on safari. Other people are like, just show it to me. Mm. And as I said earlier, I've what I feel I've designed together is people that ideal Lion King safari. I mean, I feel like I know what you want to see. If you just say, look, just set it up for me. Right. You know, tell, and I just need to know the parameters, the length of time. And we set it from there. But yeah, yeah if you're doing a 14 day trip, we're probably going to three different parks to answer your initial okay. question. Right. Now, and your trips. So my experience, I, I've done a lot of backpacking and camping and I do a lot of stuff outdoors and, and I'm a pretty primitive, I can get by on very little kinds of things, but I've seen some pictures and some videos of your safaris. You don't, you're not like, here's a can of spam and let's sit down and eat. I mean, you treat your guests very nicely. Yeah, so this is, this is not a, <laughs> that is one of the questions. Do I have to sleep in a tent? Right. And they're picturing a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout tent that they used to sleep R in right. on the fire, having to get up and cook. It's cold, damp. That's not what we do. Picture your nicest hotel room with canvas walls, and one of the walls opens up, and you are looking at the savanna or the woods, and you are in Africa. You're being greeted in the morning with a hot cup of coffee, with some biscuits and some cookies, and we're having a very nice breakfast in the bush and coming back for a lunch. And 
yes, it's all very, very nice. And you don't have to lift the finger. I take care of everything. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I do like the kind of wildlife. Let's, I don't mind sleeping on the ground and uh, all of that stuff, but sometimes it's nice to be a little pampered out in the woods as well. But, um, I can only imagine, do you ever take pictures of people of their like initial experience in, I'm sure you're shooting shots of the animals, but I can only imagine the experience that you're witnessing when your guests are witnessing Africa for the first time. Cause that's, it, it would be a life changing, would be this, wow, kind of overwhelming experience for me. And I can only imagine you probably see it on every trip. Well, you, you, you're giving me a good idea. I really should set up a GoPro in the, in the vehicles as we leave the airstrip because that is one of my most favorite portions of any safari. It never gets old is that drive when you, you're landing on a dirt airstrip. There are more than likely there's giraffe or some other wild animals on that air. They have to be rushed off by security on the ground or if it's an unmanned one, we have to buzz the, buzz the airstrip a couple of times to to move the wildlife. And so people are already amazed as they're landing and they're landing in the middle of this park, in the middle of this savanna. We get into the vehicles and sure enough, I mean, the first warthog you see, you're stopping <laughs> and then you're stopping for a giraffe and you, and it's the middle of the day. You're we're, we're middle morning. We're coming in. It's 11 o'clock in the morning. The sun is high. So the photographer in me is like, well, you won't like any of these pictures. And in the back of my mind, I know that you're going to see a lot more than this, but you still can't stop the people from doing that. Sure. But but that's the fun part. And that's yeah. what I enjoy because they say, well, how long is it going to take to camp? I said, well, if we drive straight, it's 25 minutes, but it's going to be 45 minutes <laughs> because they're stopping for everything. And then ironically, as they become more seasoned throughout the week, we were driving by the airstrip a third or fourth day. And they're like, you remember when we came here and they were telling, they're recounting it to me. They're saying, remember, we used to stop for every warthog and we stopped for this and we stopped for that. And now you know, the report is, well, we have a lion sighting that we've heard about that we can go. And now they're asking, well, is the lion up or is it sleeping? It's sleeping. <laughs> oh, don't don't stop at that one. So it is it is funny. And it in but it never gets old. I yeah. enjoy that. That's my favorite yeah. part of it. Oh, I I would I bet just the look on their faces would be just priceless. So yeah, that's a good idea. The, the GoPro, that's a great idea. God, there's so many great questions. I've got a ton of others. Peter, do you like baseball? I do. All right. And it's time for the seventh inning stretch. There we go. Well, we're going to get into what we call the seventh inning stretch, where we try to ask you a little question about baseball, right? So we're running the bases, and uh, this is what we're going to do today is our research team has pulled together a question, which uh, this completely floored me that I would have... Well, I just really had no idea, actually, that there is a baseball connection with Africa. And uh, I will say, though, so in, in just in reading through the notes, Africa was the last of these six major continents to develop baseball and one is one of the last to have produced a major league player. So the, no surprise. No surprise. They enjoy their football, or, 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 or soccer. Yes, yes. yes. So the question that I'm going to throw at you here, can you name that player 2017 a south african player played in major league baseball absolutely not <laughs> I, I would not have either i had no idea i'm not even sure if i can pronounce his name gift go a p something like that but he made his major league debut and he played for the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Toronto Blue Jays. So in 2017, we had our first South African professional baseball shortstop. Interesting. Well, I did have a couple of guests on this last trip from Chicago and they brought Cubs hats and jerseys for for the folks. There we go. Well, <laughs> so there's another baseball connection. That's even the best. Well, there we go. So that's, yeah, that's always fascinating. So now we learned a little bit as well. We've got uh, uh, players now in all, all parts of the world coming in Major League Baseball. So that's good. All right. Well, let's get back into it. Play ball. So I still want to ask you more about, obviously, about your tours, but I also want to kind of tap into something we talked about early in your introduction, you actually made a documentary of 
your experience, of some of your experiences, I guess, and maybe I'll just kind of leave it at that. The name of it, I think, is called The Third Conflict. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And not just some, but you're just not out shooting a little video out here. I mean, you actually were the best short documentary in the Chautauqua New York Film Fest. Correct. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Wow. So tell us about that experience and, and about the film. Well, it goes back to the process of educating people about the threats. And what I've always told people is that there's really three main threats that are facing our world's wildlife. And the first one is the, the illegal wildlife trade, which includes the, the poaching. And that's a really large industry that rivals the drug cartels. It's a $18, $20 billion a year business. And again, that that's something that is the average person, it's really hard for us to make a difference. That's up to the governments of our world, the world leaders to really try to make a difference and curb that business. The second issue threat facing the world's wildlife is the loss of habitat. Again, a really major, big, big problem, but again, not something that you and I can get involved in. That's the, where the nature conservancies, the, the billionaires like Paul Allen, he was a huge supporter of that, bought up Elephant Corridor, tracks millions of acres to keep things open. Um, again, not something for us to do. And then the third one is the human-animal conflict. There's a part where we can play a role, and that was the whole idea behind the third conflict, to talk about that human-animal conflict. We talked a little bit earlier about how does the wildlife live with the people, how do the people live with the wildlife. And so it's a short nine-minute documentary film just trying to get that point across, that um, there is some hope. We can do that if people can come together, if we can find a way for people to live with these animals and more importantly, benefit from wildlife. And that was the reason behind the charity that we set up, the school project and some of the other on the ground projects that we do where we can make the local people feel as though they're benefit from their wildlife. And that was the idea behind the, the putting the film out there. Mm. Well, congratulations on the film. I had no idea that poaching and, and that was that big financially of an industry. That's, uh, wow, that's massive. It is big, yes. Wow. So with this as well, then you've expanded your offerings, or I guess we'll call it education, to include India, to go see tigers in India, to go to Alaska, go see some of the wildlife in Alaska. And is that more recent? When did you start doing some things like that? That was part of the initial plan to really showcase where we have disappearing wildlife. So you talk about the the tiger. There are actually more tigers in captivity in the state of Texas alone than there are in the wild. Mm. Approximately 3,700 tigers in the wild. Um, If you go down to Brazil and the jaguars, another threatened species, the polar bear. We just came back from a polar bear safari up in Canada, another disappearing species. So really what the business was trying to showcase is the threat to the world's wildlife. I'm not, I didn't get into the business to run trips. So if you, people would say, well, I want to go to New Zealand. Peter, have you been there? Yes. Can you put together a trip? No, there's not the wildlife that we want to do we want to showcase. My mission is to showcase the world's wildlife and the ones that are being threatened in the, in the hope and belief that you may know somebody, you know somebody who knows that world leader who can make a difference. In other words, you can send all the letters you want to a political leader, but if I believe maybe one of his college roommates got to him and said, hey, we got to do something about poaching here and we really need to change this policy, he might listen. So that's my Norman Rockwell belief, hope, desire that somebody on my trip is going to be is going to be so moved by what I showcase and what I presented to them that in the years in the in the future they're going to think about it and they're going to be in a position to help make a difference. And I'll never know that that difference was made, and that's okay with me. I'm not there. I don't need the accolations. I don't need yeah. the rewards. But knowing that it might happen, yeah. and that's what keeps me going. I love that. We had uh, a show, uh, a couple of shows back, actually. I had a guest on, uh, Ken Fanger, and he had this uh, comment, and I thought it was so profound then, and you actually embody this completely. His comment was, you're not in business to make money, but um, you're in business to make money to pursue your passion, what it is that you truly want to do. And that is exactly what you do. You're, you're not, I'm not 
a tour guide. I'm not a tour business. That's not what we want to do. We do that, but that only enables us to do what we really want to do, which is educate and um, provide people the experience to broaden their world and understanding of wildlife and the world. Absolutely. I, I look at um, when I go on trips, I think the first safari I went on, I shot 7,000 images during that week. And I'll tell people on your first safari, you, you shoot everything that moves. And now I can come back in the week and shoot 700 images. Mm. I mean, there's not all the, there's still things that are on my shot list. There's still things that I'm always looking for. I always go out on every single drive hoping that I'm going to see something unique that I haven't. But for the most part, for me, I've seen a lot of that stuff. Right. And I don't take many of the shots that my, my guests do. And to your point, yes, I've been on safari enough times that if it was one, if I just want to see go on safari, I can do that. I don't need to take guests, put together a business plan and do all this other types of stuff. We're at the point in our lives where if I want to go on a trip, I'll take the trip and I'll take the family with me. But you're right. There is a calling. There is a mission to share this with other people. And that's the purpose of the business. And that's right. what drives the business going forward is the excitement of who's going to be going next. And I love seeing the excitement. I, 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 I get, I enjoy watching them have this experience because it's like nothing else. But you're right. The business doesn't need to be there for me to go on safari. Right. I can go on safari whenever I want. I don't need to drag <laughs> six or eight or your family to go with me uh, to do that. So the business has evolved. It has grown beyond that point where right. you're trying to fund other things and grow the business. It's now uh, self-sustaining. It's profitable. It grows and it can do all these things. But selfishly, it's about making that difference for the animals and the mm -hmm. people. And I believe that the way that we can improve the lives of wildlife is by improving the lives of people that live with that wildlife. And that's what continues for me to continue mm -hmm. to do this. And that's kind of actually a nice segue into what I wanted to pursue a little bit as well, which um, you mentioned earlier about the foundation. And so you've done, so beyond even deeper, I'll say, Beyond educating people that you take on your trips uh, to understand wildlife, you actually do are active, are integrated into the lives of the locals as well. You've established a uh, foundation, the Satao Wildlife Foundation. You've done so many incredible things, whether through that foundation or other types of activities, philanthropic activities. And so you're just so uh, involved, I guess, embedded in what is um, happening in the worlds that you visit. Tell us a little bit about the Wildlife Foundation and some of the things that you've been able to accomplish through that foundation. So... When people have an experience of going on safari, many of them are moved. It's a profound impact. They want to have some type of involvement. They'll ask me, how can we help? What can we do? And it's anywhere from, you know, giving them Cubs jerseys to building a school. And with the finance background, I didn't want to intermingle funds. I wanted to have transparency. I wanted to know that if someone gave me some money for a particular reason, I wanted to prove they know that and I know that it would go the right place but I wanted to have the, the vehicle sure, to, show, sure. to show that it was going there so we created the the Satao Wildlife Foundation which is a 501c3 public charity in the US and it's a way that when a guest comes to me or someone here locally says I want to help I know what you're doing in Africa and I want to contribute to this project and they write me a check it now goes into a separate corporation it doesn't go into Peter Safari's or Peter Balanek's pocket and then I have to worry about intermingling the funds. So just, again, it goes back to my background. It was easy for me to set up. For a lot of people, it's a challenge, but it's, it's, it's in my background, my wheelhouse. And it really got started when in, in the first big project we did, again, shooting from the hip, we're visiting a local school that we, that the camp takes all of their guests to, and we bring school supplies, and we come out of this building that's 20 by 40, that has a tin wall, tin roof, concrete floor, no chalkboard, and there's 80 kids sitting on the floor. Hmm. And my friend David, who was another tour leader, says to me, boy, the, Peter, those kids really could use some desks. I said, David, they need a building. My chickens live in a nicer coop. And literally, right. if you've seen the chicken coop that my 
chickens had. It was nicer than that. <laughs> and so I asked the guide, I said, what's it take to build a classroom? How much does it cost? He says, $7,500. And I'm like, that's it? And I'm looking down and I'm shooting a lens that costs more than that. I shoot a body, a camera body that costs more than that. And I said, the reality is if I just don't upgrade any of my equipment or don't get a new iPhone, I can build a classroom. And then as I thought about it, I'm like, well, no. I mean, we come from America. I could build a classroom and a new camera and a new iPhone and do all these things. They just have to make the decision that this is what I want to do. Right. So they did have a business plan. And of course, being American and go big or go home, I said, well, here's a master plan. And they would they would get donors to build one classroom at a time. And they said, well, we have a vision for a, a building that would be an administration block. And it had four classrooms in it and two offices or four offices. And I said, well, that's what we're going to do. I'm like $30,000, $40,000. Again, where we're coming from sure. compared to where they are. And I thought, okay, we'll do some fundraising for this, so we should be able to do that. And the following week, we were back at that school with, again, some of David's clients, and they asked about the school project. And they went to the headmaster, and they said, oh, you need to talk to Peter. So now all of a sudden, apparently, I'm the fundraiser for this project. (laughs) And they were from the U.K., and I described to them, it's a four-building concept. It's going to be fifty or $60,000. This is what we're doing. There's no one, no business plan. There's no formal offering. Literally took him three minutes to tell him about the project. He looked. He says, how much does a classroom cost? $7,500. He looks at his wife and he looks back at me and goes, we'll take two. Wow. I'm like, this is easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Fundraising like this. Here's, here's $15,000 on my word and my reputation. Right. So I told the headmaster, I said, yeah, go ahead and build the school. And because I knew that I had another guest of mine who wanted to do some things and piece things together. But again, it goes back to Mm. the same way I got into the business of the safaris. I got into the charity. I see it. I see an opportunity to make a difference. I mean, I've always told my kids, I said, to whom much is given, much is expected. And that's a personal attitude. I'm a graduate of St. Ignatius Jesuit education. And our motto is men for others. And this is an opportunity for me to do that, to live it. Mm -hmm. It was always there. You said, are you an entrepreneur? Yes, I was always an entrepreneur. I've always been someone who cared about others. I also know how fortunate I am. I work very hard for being fortunate. As they talk, the harder you work, the luckier you get. All of those things are true. I mean, it's all been hard work. But I do believe that I have a skill set and that I can help people and I can make a difference and I can still take care of myself at the same time. I feel I've got that capacity to give and to help other people. So is the school is up, completed? School is up. In, in, in true Peter fashion, we went from just an idea in February to the grand opening in October of that same year. Mm. So again, I don't like to drag things out. Yeah. Make, have a plan of action. That's awesome. And you've taken some, you've partnered with Cleveland Medwish, right? Is that Mm -hmm. something that's still ongoing and you still do that? We still have a relationship uh, with Medwish. We went there and took 12 doctors on safari. It was a half safari, half medical trip where they went into the local clinic, worked there for three days, went to two different camps and uh, gave everyone health checkups and wellness checkups. And again, another opportunity where we try to bring people together and and for a win-win. They're in Mm -hmm. the business of going out and helping provide medical supplies. So they still right. continue to provide uh, medical supplies on some of my trips when I have excess baggage. I'll see what the clinic needs and go down the Medwish and go shopping in their big warehouse and uh, and fill up our suitcases as much as we can and take the supplies over. And you also do some like a, a family philanthropic adventure. So if we wanted to go and that was truly our mission. Well, that, was, that, that idea came from another family office advisor here in town who said, well, we're looking for experiences for our guests. They've done everything. They've been everywhere. And we decided to brand that and call it to, as a talking point to, to have discussions with people. And these are for those families that are charitably inclined. They probably have a history of giving their own family foundation or a donor advised right. fund. And they sit around at Thanksgiving and say, well, we've got X amount of dollars to give this year. Why don't we do something with it? And so if they have something in mind, maybe they're into the schools or first responders, which would be the rangers in this case over there. We could, it's an opportunity for them to, to donate, to do a, a project, and then to go over there on safari with this great family experience. But then more importantly, go meet the people whose lives they've changed. 
So when we did the grand opening of the school, the donors, many of the donors, the big donors, were on that trip with us. And so they could see where their money went. And that's really a powerful way. So it's a more, today's generation wants to have impact giving. They want to see where it's going. Right, right. The days of our parents writing a check and sending it off to some large corporation have gone. They want to know where, where's the money going. Right, right. And so that's an opportunity. And they don't have to have an idea. We can also go on safari and see what sparks their interest and whatever they want to then follow through with, then I'll implement for them on, be, on their behalf. That's, uh, I love that. You've gotten so integrated, I guess, and so much of your activity has involved the, the Maasai people through your various tours. Some of the charitable work that you've done, the school is for the Maasai children. I understand that just recently you've been honored by the Maasai. Can you tell us about that experience? Well, they, that was tied to the, the school project. Okay. And so there, it's a very sincere and genuine community. And yeah, they're always joking that I'm the white Maasai and they take me, tour me through the town and introduce me. And a lot of people know who I am. And they just mention, oh, that's Peter and the one who did the school. And yeah, we've done some other connections too. A couple of years ago, we brought uh, over one of my Maasai friends here and did a presentation for the community and that was all received. And and that's something we're going to again, do this upcoming May. COVID's really put a damper on the, the marketing yeah, for this. Right. Everybody who travels with me has some personal connection, and we don't do a lot of internet marketing or other things. People call and they say, well, so-and-so told me to call you, and and that's the connection. And coming here in May, we're bringing over three or four Maasai from Kenya to come here and integrate the community, talk to the the people around here, tell their story about how wildlife, wildlife has impacted and improved their lives and to be able to draw that connection because um, we are developing quite a reputation. Cleveland is quite a reputation over in that area <laughs> from all the guests and things that we've done. That's amazing. Well, definitely let me know because I would love to go and, and bring my kids to, to learn from the Maasai. You mentioned about you don't do you know a lot of internet marketing. What do you do for marketing for? I, I mean, you, you're not just purely by word of mouth, I'm imagining you probably do something. I mean, you brought this beautiful brochure here for me, but. No, it's all literally face-to-face, one-on-one. Mm. So that brochure that you have there, the game plan was I printed up 1,500 of those, going back to my natural market in the insurance world and sitting down and having a cup of coffee and talking to people about this. And what I have found, again, is that people who I've talked to are always wanted to go do this, but didn't know how to do it, and they were afraid. But now that they know that I'm on this trip, and I've done this for so many years, and for some of their friends, it just naturally flows into planning these things. But they do take six to 18 months to plan, because we are trying to, I'm trying to show you a piece of Africa that I believe existed 50 years ago, which means less people, less crowds, less of a, a better quality experience. I'm trying to take you to a camp where your group or your family are going to be the only guests there, or we're doing a mobile tenant safari where you're the only people there. And these things take time because you're looking to you know block out an entire camp and more and more people are, are doing safaris. But no, all of my marketing is face-to-face word of mouth. That's amazing. If you call, if you call me from California and you want to yeah. order a safari, I need to know how you found me. Yeah. Because you're generally not going to find me on an internet search. I mean, once you know that I exist, yes, I'm all over the internet, as your researchers <laughs> have found. And if you hang out on my Facebook page, I mean, that's the best place to see all the activity. That's where you see when I'm on Safari and I'm posting right. pictures on a regular basis. How, how far in advance do you have trips planned at this point? Do you have plans for 22? 22, 22 and 23. Okay. We, we haven't, COVID really has been an issue because right. it's been hard to talk to people about safaris or any type of travel, Travel, you know, at least for the first year, the thought of even trying to, and this is not something you can do on zoom. I mean, you see it here face to face, (laughs) the difference, the excitement, the passion, the inflection, it it all comes across when we can meet face to face. And we haven't been able to do that. And against my better judgment, but I mean, we printed all these brochures, they're sitting in the closet and I did send them out to a select mailing list and we'll do some follow up on that to create some awareness. But really the plan was close to have dozens, if not hundreds of meetings, face-to-face meeting people. Uh, But yes, all my guests do come from word of mouth. Good. Okay. You've done so 
many amazing things. You've uh, continued just to touch uh, the lives of both your guests that you take, as well as the people of the Maasai. What do you see around the corner, either for Peter or, or for Peter's safaris? Well, what you're going to see if things work out, and it's still in the early stages, putting down more permanent routes in Kenya. Okay. We'll just leave it at that. Wow. That's nice. So if I decide like, hey, I'm, we're going to take a trip, I, let me call Peter. He's in Kenya. We'll stop by and uh, have lunch come or something. And visit, <laughs> come to my place and we'll hang out. And like I said, this year has been four months this year. This yeah. is the most I've spent over there. But it's it was incredible. a great opportunity during COVID and trying to tell people that it's a great time to travel. Right. There's fewer people there. I've had great, I've had wonderful sightings and wonderful wildlife and experience during the COVID period. Hmm. Well, Peter, it's been such a joy having you on here. We're at this point of the show we call the bottom of the ninth. And this is where I get to ask you just really kind of your advice. You, you've lived such a, a full life thus far and you've got a whole nother life ahead of you yet. But what advice do you have for rookies in the game? Those just starting out, people that are thinking about starting a business, what kind of things can you provide? You know, I've the best advice I have is to, to know your market, know what you want to do. You can't be everything to everyone. I think that was one of the challenges that I, I learned early on in the insurance world is I was trying to be everything to everyone. I wanted to have that client who wanted a $100,000 term policy, but I also wanted that business owner who needed $10 million of estate planning. And you can't serve all of those different people. And in the safari marketplace, going back to what I've just said Everyone comes through to me referrals. I'm not going to branch out to internet marketing. That's not the clientele that I'm looking for. I lead four to five select groups each year. That's what I want to do. I can focus on the quality. I can control it. I can give you that personal experience. I'm not trying to be one of the major companies. I don't have to be on Safari 50 weeks a year. So the, knowing your market and knowing who you want to serve, the value that you provide to that person, make it clear what you can do for them. And you're going to have to be able to say no to people that come. Just It's not a good fit. You know? And you can refer them someplace else, but it's not what you do. Right. So I can set you up with a camping trip. I can tell you where to do it. But there's no value in me leading that trip. Right. So in the past, I may have, in a previous life, may have said, okay, Randy, I'll set that up for you and try to do it. That's not really what I do. So knowing your market, knowing what services you have to offer and the the advantage to that market is what you really need to do. Good stuff. All right. I love it. So go check out petersafaris.com all over Facebook as well. I'm, that's your Facebook page, Peter Safaris. Correct. Okay. Instagram probably same, same as well. One. Peter Safaris. So go just some incredible, incredible pictures of photos videos of some amazing experiences there. Peter, it's just been such a joy having you in the show, in the program, just getting to talk with you. There's so many things we didn't even touch on, kind of local and your involvement in the local community and the business and organizations here, but we could, we'll, we'll invite you to come back and have a little local flavor. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure meeting. I'm glad we, I'm glad we met. Yeah. Yeah. When's the next trip though? When is it? The middle of February. There we go. I'll be thinking of you then because I would love to take a trip in February out of the snow belt. <laughs> you do. Yes. <laughs> That's so great. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for being on the show. I truly appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank All you for right. having me, Randy. All right, folks, uh, that is a ball game. Thanks for joining us today. And if you like our show, Please tell your friends, subscribe and review, and we'll see you around the ballpark. Running the Bases with Small Businesses is brought to you by 38 Digital Market, a digital marketing agency committed to client growth with lead generation, higher conversions, and increased sales. Connect with us today at 38digitalmarket.com.